I would like to spend some time with you to discuss the operator's journey to the cloud native solution based on the ONF software. And uh, before I will go to any sort of details, I would like to start with something which I really love as an example. This is the very nice picture showing world high jump record in Olympics. And actually, if you look on this graph, you will see like, okay, it's not just regular graph. The results are forming in a very tangible pattern. And if you think about those glitches, like what was happening exactly here or there, or especially there, famous 1968, Mr. Fosbury, it was always about changing of technology, technique, technology. Uh, so the message of this is all about the disruption. And in Deutsche Telekom, I always say uh, a joke that if we will work like, if, if the world will evolve like DT is trying to, to make it, we will be always doing a tiny little few percent improvement year to year. So this, this graph will be a full linear soul of evolution. But fortunately, there are some crazy guys like this Open Networking Foundation, and they are not evolving like this, they are trying to make a disruption. So disruption for me is always about uh, when someone is trying to question the status quo. And I was having this panel discussion, we had this uh, in the morning actually, and for me questioning the status quo is that okay, instead of doing the same story just a few percent better, I am trying to do certain things completely differently. And because we have this privilege here to be in Santa Clara, actually the, the heart of the Silicon Valley, I think that the transistor use case is wonderful here. Mr. William Shockley and his, you know, guys who then finally formulated the virtual, uh, uh, virtual uh, semiconductor and then finally Intel. That will be a huge history itself and it's very good place to, to discuss about it. So the key message, okay, use this radical uh, disruption. Okay, but then the natural question, the next question would be like, okay, if we are talking about an open source, why the hell you are talking about this now? Open source is not something new. Open source flies around, I don't know, IT for years. So why you're talking about the telco open source now, not 10 years later? And I think that, you know, I will not go through all these bullets. You will receive the presentation. But for me, the key point is that there are two very important points. So first point, we already started as a telco operators to take this journey towards the software and hardware decoupling by the network function virtualization. All this stuff related with OpenStack, Etsy, NFVI, reference model, etc., etc. Even more, right now, we are going to the next step which is a microservice-based architecture, which is imposing even more decoupling, like, okay, instead of having a huge silo-based software pieces, I would like to have decomposed uh, architecture when, I don't know, diameter proxy. We had a fantastic discussion with Lyle. So diameter termination service could be a microservice completely handling my diameter messages, whatever it's, uh, it's doing for. So it's blurring the borders if I will uh, bring the SGSN MME box today, maybe within a few years from now, it will be not single box. It will be just a bunch of microservices. And if I will instantiate the microservice, which is called diameter, maybe it could be shared by the many network functions and my border will be just showing that, okay, this function is, by the way, shared by many network components. So we have this road right now. And finally, the third bullet from my perspective, you know, I work with the proprietary solutions like, you know, well-known established vendors for years. And I have a very good relationship with their R&Ds. You know, the, the significant difference compared to what was, I don't know, 15 years ago to what it's now, is that in the end of the day, they already use an open source completely. So, you know, if you would think about how much open source we already have in our networks, that'll be probably, I don't know, more than 80%. The only tiny little difference is that 
they are stitching around the, you know, tiny little Cisco brand, Nokia brand, whatever, and saying like, you know, that's our fantastic Star OS system. But what's the Star OS is? It's in the end of the day, it's Linux, or sort of an open source component. Even more with the microservice uh, ar based architecture, we have an Istio service broker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You will uh, go more and more towards this open sor source component. So that is exactly the moment when is. Uh, the, this, this change of mindset is really possible. I mean, it's no longer, we had this panel discussion, it's no, no longer impossible to speak about the real open source use in networking. I think that this is exactly the momentum and I would love to leverage this momentum. Uh, one more thing be, be before I will jump to the technical details. I think it's quite important to remember about this 12 factors. So 12 factors is a set of properties. Uh, you can actually Google it uh, uh, for checking the cloud native apps. And it was of course developed in an IT industry, but I was doing the assessment with my team how the operator itself is prepared to handle, um, let's say open source software in the context of usability of it. And I think that whatever operators is trying to say like, yes, I would like to go to an open source, it should ask, try, at least try to answer those questions. Like, okay, how I am fine with the configuration, how, am, how I'm dealing with the dependencies, code base treating, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that that's quite important assessment. And unfortunately, my sort of assessment is that this still is not, uh, well established enough, uh, at least on an operator side, yeah. But at least it's important to actually know how this is working. Good, so let's focus on the case study which I would like to present today. So case study is fully working on an, something which is called FMS and FMC. And when I discuss with a bunch of CTOs in Deutsche Telekom uh, group, we always have this debate like, what is really possible to make it in a production? What does it mean really possible to make it in a production? Uh, it simply means to rely on it and to put the real traffic. And we decided actually with my team that the best potential use case is to start with something which is called fixed mobile substitution. I will have a dedicated slide on it. The key message is, to, uh, is just like this. Start as simple as it possible, uh, just uh, without any sort of virtualization. I fully agree with L what Lai was mentioning is that before you will think about how to deploy certain application like Kubernetes, uh, OpenStack, whatever, you should first start to think about, you know, what to put there, yeah? So we was even considering a bare metal and actually our work right now is even bare metal, yeah? So that is exactly what we, what we assumed. And of course we started, to, we joined actually the ecosystem some time ago and we said, okay, if we have already a tangible framework, let's rely on it and let's try to, to use this Omega and Comac reference design actually to work it. Few words about the fixed mobile substitution, what the animal is. So actually this is a product which we are selling. So the product is nothing like a router. It's nothing more than a router, which is just using a backhaul technology as a uh, uplink. Uh, so it's of course being sold as an equivalent for a fixed access, so that's the reason why we are calling it fixed mobile substitution. Uh, but it's important to understand that it's not true that we are not using mobility me related mechanisms. So of course we have all this self-breathing uh, uh, stories related with network, life cycle, etc., etc. So we of course have all this uh, sort of mobility requirements, however, from the gateway perspective, we are really working on something which I could say minimum viable product uh, subset. Simply means no DPI, no GX, uh, no GY, very simple use case. Actually the key sort of parameters, critical parameters is just the ability to cut bandwidth because the product is being sold in uh, two profiles, 20 and 60 megabits per second. Of course, the bloody lawful interception, which we as an operators will always need to fulfill. And of course, data retention. Data retention simply means billing. So it's not means billing for counting like how much money you use because this is fixed. Retention means that if certain government authority will ask me 
who owns the session from this and that, I need to have the data being stored according to, to law. And of course, in terms of the uh, coverage, of course, we are initially focused only on 4G. We have the technical solution actually how to cover uh, the relevant cases by selecting the users for our trial uh, only using 4G. Now the focus on the gateway. Uh, of course, from the entire landscape, we are talking only about the gateway. I personally had a lot of discussions even today. I honestly believe that the gateway is the best starting point for evolution. MME and SGSN is much more complex. The gateway selection from the technology standpoint of view is very nice and feasible because we can use a fancy algorithm which is widely deployed by actually all the vendors, all the SGSN MME vendors. This is called APN resolution extension mechanism. So if I have two subscribers and both of them actually are using the same APN and they are coming from the same tracking area code, I can use the APN resolution extension to say Mr. A will go to my reference open source gateway and Mr. B will go and stay on the, uh, on the legacy platform. This feature is quite important not to do something like a magic push button. So because of this feature actually we designed it and with this we can steer the process of offloading the network appropriately. So our plan is of course to start with a few hundreds of customers just to have a uh, reference sort of proof of concept, but once we will be able to prove that this is working, our plan next year is actually to to start to gradually invest in the uh, capacity extensions absolutely relying on an open source. So that's, that's here the principle. And of course then we, ha we, we, uh, we have a certain algorithm actually how to offload and how to reprovision the parameters. Uh, one of the ways is to change the charging characteristic flag in HLR and HSS. Then the mechanism is working like this, that SGSN and MME, when it's sending the DNS query, exactly like Lai was presenting, can add charging characteristic to the APN. And then in DNS, actually, I can configure a different gateway IP address for the APN with charging characteristic extension. And then I can gradually say, like, okay, customer, I don't know, B, C, D, whatever, they should go to the open source. Good. So. Let's go to the key technical requirements. In terms of the key technical requirements, I tried to collect them into the certain sections. Of course, I will not go through all, all of them right now. I would just like to highlight certain points which are maybe not so obvious. So first of all, um, let's start from the uh, interfaces which need to be implemented. It's of course, we are talking about the gateway. So S1U, S11, S5, SX, SGY, lawful interception, GTPP for this offline billing and GN uh, in case of implementing 2G, 3G. So that's quite obvious. More tricky thing is starting around generic functions because unfortunately, even if I have uh, my friend and 10 years ago, I had a bet with him like when IPv6 will rule out IPv4 completely, unfortunately I lost because uh, 10 years has gone and actually, especially in the mobile ecosystem, bloody operators are still using IPv4 like hell. That's unfortunately true for Deutsche Telekom as well. So here, fundamental question is what we are doing with nothing. So actually platform itself is not providing the NAT functionality. Uh, one of the solutions is of course to rely on the Linux uh, NAT platform, uh, but that's something which we are considering right now. Yeah. The other of option, of course, is uh, to use external NAT, but that's also not helping with the decreasing of the cost. Yeah. Uh, now the other point, uh, routing and forwarding functions. I was mentioning that we are relying on DPDK. Actually, uh, we were spending with Ashok from Intel like weeks actually from now, and we discovered a potential serious bug actually around key and I for DPDK. Uh, why I'm mentioning it? Because, you know, when you are using DPDK technology, then you need to figure out one important thing, that DPDK simply means that when packet arrives on your Linux, uh, on your interface card, the DMA controller is starting to copy packet directly for a user's paint plane. That's exactly how we are getting back, uh, how we are trying to accelerate the traffic and bypass the kernel. So you say, wonderful. 
but the the drawback of this is that I actually are losing all this fancy Linux you know functionalities like basic routing, even a simple ARP functionality, which you could say, come on, it's super basic, it should be there. It's nothing, it's there. You need to implement it. So one of the alternatives is that okay, you are saying, okay, I want to actually focus only on the traffic which is uh, effective for me. So let's put only GTP means GN effectively traffic for DPDK for the fast path and let's forward everything else directly to kernel to have this flexibility for um, I don't know simple routing protocol that you don't need to implement OSPF from your from, from from starting point yeah and that is exactly why why key and I was inverted so it's kernel network interface the drawback of the solution is that it was not so much tested at least based on our exercise it looks like there are some bugs around it so right now we have a heavily discussions like should we stick with this or maybe we should go to something which is called zero copy zero copy technology is also actually covered by Intel and it's helping to have both of board worlds because on one side it's keeping all these Linux functionalities on the other side is uh, getting the same benefits of DPDK so actually zero copy means we are not we are not copying packets from kernel to user space because user in kernel space can share the same memory. Yeah. So I'm highlighting all these things because that's really important in terms of the um, flexibility and scalability factors. The last important things which I would like to really bring here as an example, and that is I believe which guys from IT world, and please do not be, uh, do not try to, to, to understand me that I'm trying to offend someone. It's just the point like, you know, a simple question like, if you write a certain program in Linux in any sort of IT environment, what is the typical scenario for, configura for configuration? Any examples? How you are making a changes in any of the Linux file uh, programs? What is the way? I don't know, Quagga, DNS, whatever. How you are changing a configuration in Linux? By? Exactly, by con so you, you have etc slash config, whatever, you are changing the configuration and then what you are not doing next? Ah, restart, that was well, exactly, thank you very much, that was, the, uh, that was exactly the answer which I was trying to, uh, to, to, to hear. Restart, I love this answer, restart. So let's figure out you have 100,000 PDP context established. established. You have a control plane which is working and you just want to extend IP pool to add additional 100 addresses. You are doing it and voila, restart. So 100,000 sessions crashed and they are just, by the way, you know, creating a tiny little stor storm in your network. Yeah, nothing, not, 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 not too bad. Honestly, I'm joking a little bit, but when I presented this to my team, the guys who was working like more than 20 years in operations, and I was describing them because I, 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 what I did, I downloaded the fantastic Lice contribution C3PO code. I did it over the weekend. I said, the guys, wonderful. I have an open source. Let's play it around it, yeah? And they were starting to ask me the question like, okay, how to change the IP pool? And I said, no, no, I, I'm restarting it and it's done, yeah? So you can, you can understand like what was the reason and honestly, and that is leading me to this slide, uh, that is the famous discussion like what's more important, quantity or quality. And I think uh, we had this very nice example with the car. Like if you would like to buy a car, you have two options. Option number A is that it will be full feature set car with all the features, including security features, air, air conditioning, etc. But every single feature will be like 50% broken versus the other solution. You will have zero configuration, super basic feature, actually no, no, fun, no even security features, but it will drive consistently. So if you turn left, it will really turn left. If you will turn right, it will really go right. And of course, the obvious answer is to make the, qu the quality, actually. Yeah? And I think, and that is my push to ONF, to not to really think about a fancy features. I don't know, DPI, uh, whatever. 
before the car will consistently turn left when we will be turning left and vice versa. So for me, for example, the functionality of zero, zero configuration, what does it mean zero configuration change? Zero outage configuration change is, for example, if I have a request from operation field to add new APN to my network, which was never used, it will never, ever, ever need to require a restart because there is no functional requirement for restarting the entire controller. That's super basic. In the world of proprietary solutions, in the world of Cisco Ericsson, that's super obvious. In a world of open source, it's not super obvious. But my message is like this. If we will not consistently convince operators that the very sort of basic stuff of features is working consistently, reliably, without tho those kind of things, they will never even consider to play around this with the higher use cases. And that is honestly the reason why I'm pushing so much on this quality and still postponing, etc. Uh, because we are seeing some crashes, etc. I would like to have, I'm absolutely happy to have the solution like, I don't know, I'm missing 90% uh, of the features which are present in a proprietary solutions. Yeah, that's absolutely super fine for me. What is not super fine for me is that, I don't know, IP fragmentation will cause the hang up of the solution. Or for example, yeah, th that was one of the case, yeah. Originally, and Jig was not supporting IP fragmentation. You could say, come on, it's 21st century. Uh, jumbo frames. <laughs> if you will go to a network operator, I don't know, whatever, in Romania, uh, whatever actually, you will probably have an SGSN or MME from MK8 from, or MK6 from Ericsson, and 1,500 bytes is the only option for GN interface. Simply means if you don't support fragmentation, Sorry, <laughs> it will never work. So very simple feature which could say, uh, maybe it's optional, it's not optional, it's really blocking. And I think that this quality is super important thing. So we raised like, I don't know, more than 100 tickets. Uh, they are more related with this, those three categories. Uh, so billing, low phone interception, control and uh, play and, uh, and data plane CLI. So maybe the things which from the functionality standpoint of view, they are not so critically important, but from an operator perspective, they are super important. Another example, I don't know, your CTO is calling to you, hmm, I'm staying in Spain on the holidays and my data is not working. And you are logging to Fantastic Engine. How, you, how you can troubleshoot it? You cannot even s get an IP address of the session. I mean, of course you can do it if you are a programmer. You know how to hex dump a certain memory, uh, you know, uh, place and maybe do an examination of the hex dump, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my point. I mean, those very basic sort of the features are really super, super essential. And the positive message is that uh, we are consistently moving forward. Actually, we are trying also to promote it to other operators. My message here for the community will be like, Whoever is interested, I'm absolutely super happy and open to, to promote it, to help you. Uh, I think that together with the guys from, from Intel and from ONF community, actually we, we get an extensive broad of knowledge. Uh, one of the proofs was actually a very nice demo, which we did uh, on Barcelona. It took only uh, like two weeks actually to bring the control plane, which was in my lab in Warsaw. And the entire user plane was actually implemented in Barcelona. It was really perfectly working. So that's in the context of the 30 milliseconds of the control and user plane split, Lyle, uh, you remember our discussion. Still, I understand that it was not heavily loaded, <laughs> not even close to heavily loaded. Uh, I'm sorry? Ah, true, that is exactly. Great, and the last slide, because I am just uh, uh, getting to, to, to end of timer, so timers are important because they are generating interrupts. Uh, so, quality is king, that's always my message. After years of speaking with the guys uh, from a lot of different operators, uh, uh, especially in the context of the shared service center in Deutsche Telekom, I can say that very basic features are super important subset in order to be successful in open source. Uh, so, in terms of the pipeline, we are right now very close to something which is called field trial 
actually this software is consistently working in my lab using Spirant and some you know friendly users which are uh, T-Mobile employees simply so I'm not breaking any sort of law and they are helping me to crash the system and to prove that this is maybe not super stable. Um, once we will prove that this is stable, the next plan actually is to put really um, production customers, fulfilling all this lawful interception and legal data retention requirements. And of course, based on it, we actually, I would love to see ability to build uh, extra capacity in the network fully relying on an open source. Especially that from my perspective, the use case is super positive because majority of RFQs driven in Europe right now, they are mostly driven with the capacity extension. And the capacity extension today is a key factor. So we are super tightly uh, fitting with the requirement, especially if, if you will speak with the CTO guys, they will always see the money. It's like this fantastic movie, show me the money. and. This famous scene is always, you know, winning all these stages. You can bring thousands of nice features. Features he will show you like one slide. Show me the money, and I I believe that we can show the money here with this message. Actually, we did a TCO calculation. It was super attractive, of course, assuming that it will work. That's tiny little if. Um, so that's it in terms of uh, my presentation. Of course, there was a number of questions uh, during the last uh, workshops. How about other features? As I said, I mean, if we'll be able to prove that this is working stable, I am super happy to see other use cases addressing mobile broadband, addressing campus networks, addressing the things like, I don't know, even going beyond to SGSN MME. I think that our plan is exactly fulfilling the concept Start small, learn fast, grow fast, and that will be all. Thank you very much. And if you have any <laughs> questions, I'm super open to answer them. So I'm going to suggest that we take a few questions and then make some announcements and see how people like them. Uh, our assumption is like this uh, in terms of the uh, network design. To have one U server, that one U server with ability to handle 10 gigabits per second, and those 10 gigabits per second will be few hundred of customers considering the fixed mobile substitution. And that's then quite consistently scalable, even without thinking about any sort of open stack, etc. Initially, with my team, we even developed, a pre we prepared actually a script which is doing an automated configuration. So whenever you are adding new capacity, script is automatically preparing the gateway configuration and is pulling up the configuration to the, uh, to the so you can, you can use, for example, the module like Ironic to just provision bare metal, like in OpenStack, but just finish bare metal provisioning on this level and then put the configuration on yourself. Yeah. No, no, mobility is absolutely full support, fully supported, exactly. Uh -huh. Absolutely, that is one of the critical requirements. That was exactly what I was saying is that and even... The other thing you can assume is like the mega speed stuff, right? Yeah, the, 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 point is, the point is like this. Um, if you think that's mobility related fe uh, features, yeah? If you think about, um, if you think about fixed mobile substitution, even if you will put this router here, it will not be attached to the same cell over a consistent period of time because of cell breathing, et cetera, et cetera. So the reason, that is the reason why we need to support mobility. However, of course, if you have uh, mobility like IRAT from 4G to 3G, then of course at certain point of time it will not work because the software is not supporting 3G. But then the 3GPP specs are handling it because you are you know, getting to the other gateway because of the um, APN re um, uh, discovery mechanism that you are, okay, there is no 3G functionality and there is no topology on on this gateway enabled. So that's, that's fine. So yeah. for you, what's the benefit of using open source? The benefit, you know, I, I always love to see this argument like show me the money. I think that for operators, the key driver is always money. And I think that if you will be able to show the factor like 10 times reduction on a TCO on the total cost of ownership, including licenses, operation support, et cetera, et cetera, including hardware, exactly, that's a huge number. So even if you will be in a range from, I don't know, around 10 factor, that's a huge factor. And uh, I think that the promise of being close around these numbers is sufficient enough 
to get to win and to enter a huge operators. And I'm pretty sure that uh, that could be a most important driver. Yeah. Of course, we can always discuss once we will prove that this is working about nice, nice, fancy little other drivers like innovation, being a speed, etc. You know, I can always dance and do a nice presentations. But honestly, based on the discussions which we have with the operators right now, especially in Europe, the demand is huge on the capacity. The curve is going like this, and in the same time there is decreased requirement in terms of the flex, uh, sophistication of the features. So the winning products consistently across the operators are the flex, flat fee services, yeah? That's it. Of course you could do so, uh, but, but uh, we was not testing it, but actually th the question is like, what will be the real use case? Look, if you have, I, I, I'm not, I, no, 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 what is the use case for an open source? Because I'm always considering open source as an add-on. I do not believe in a short period of time that there will be a single operator who will say like, I'm kicking off everything and that's it. So m m from my perspective, the Volta is probably generating, I don't know, up to one gigabit per second of the traffic. The sessions, okay, the sessions depending on your business model, but it's not, not, not causing a, a huge problem. I think that the other potential use case which would be really beneficial is edge computing. Because in edge computing, there is a fundamental question like when you will, where you will terminate your mobility. Even if you will have, I don't know, there is a company like we discussed, Mobile Edge, uh, Mobile, Mobile Edge X. By the way, Jason will be uh, tomorrow on the keynote, one of the keynote sessions. So anyway, Mobile Edge X is one of the companies who are doing the, uh, the, 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 the stack. And of course, they, they are saying, okay, we can go to a far edge to run aggregation side. But then the fundamental question is who will terminate the IP session on the run aggregation side? And then immediately there is an actual question, okay, I can go with my proprietary vendor. But even if you will go with your proprietary vendor, then the cost is really huge. Because, you know, even the, if this could be only one U server, one rack, because you have 10 gigabits per second on this regional so run aggregation. We support, but actually there is no features around uh, IMS in terms of the gateway, because uh, all the features related with Volti, like SV interface, they are terminated on MME. So from the gateway perspective, actually the only thing which you need to do is actually to support the ability to create the beer and that's it. That's it. Of course, one of the question is uh, about this uh, GX interface. So once GX interface will be implemented because you need to, um, you need to carry over the quality uh, of service parameters to PCSCF. So actually PCSCF is talks to PCRF and PCRF talks to, to gateway. So, so once GX will be available, uh, then Volta could be handled absolutely yeah, without any issues. Absolutely, I love this question. And you know, depends who, uh, w what is being asked, my heart or my brain. So if my heart will be asked, then I would immediately say, of course I would like to do everything within an operator, yeah? I would love to be uh, with an operator in a stage like operator really owns certain things. To have really pure engineers which are paid well, which are taking a full responsibility and that's actually what the companies like Google are doing. There's always this fancy question like why Google is not sending this bloody SRFQs for servers? Why the hell they are trying to do the servers themselves? It's so easy to send an RFQ. I have a few templates, I can help them. Um, I think that that will be, of course, my heart. My brain is telling me, ah, oh, come on, it's very specific environment. So I would rather see in a short term a probability for having an operators, hiring uh, subcontractors like local integrators who know the network locally very well because there's no local knowledge about the surrounding ecosystems, AAA server, PCRF, GX, whatever, even run, local run conditions are very essential. I do not believe that initially on the early stage of rollout, roll cer cer central companies like, I don't know, we experimented with Vipro, for example. This was really not working well. Of course, but then on the operator side, I am absolutely with you. You are absolutely right. Uh, still, I would see the role of operator for doing a conformance testing verification. And I think that the benefit which ONF is getting from an operator is that it's giving an actually a very positive feedback about what should be added, what features are missing, what bugs, etc., etc. Yeah? So that's more or less how I see it and how I envision it in the long term. 
Perfect. Thank you very much.